If an evil Christmas demon was coming to kill everyone in your town, what would you do? Many years ago, these adults secretly committed a terrible crime, bringing on the wrath of a powerful ancient spirit. Now, the witch is back for revenge, and she won't stop until their entire bloodlines pay the price. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the cannibal witch in Mother Krampus. <laughs> There's an uninvited guest coming to Christmas dinner, and this year, human flesh is on the menu. At a church in town, this young boy spots a trail of grandma candies leading down the aisle. His mother is too distracted to notice as he follows the trail to the end of the row, where he finds the absolute mother load. But hold on, it's a trap. A hooded figure is watching him from the open doorway, beckoning him over with the promise of more sweet treats. But the moment that he gets too close, he's snatched away in the blink of an eye, never to be seen or heard from again. Okay, didn't this kid's parents or his gym teacher ever tell him not to go around taking candy from strangers? And I'm holding the parents equally responsible for little Timmy here, ending up in the Krampus sack. Now, it may be too late for him, but we can still learn from his mistakes so that we'll be prepared the next time that this thing shows up. First off, it's definitely not a good sign that this creeper here was willing to get so close to a church. In most cases, evil beings tend to steer clear of these kind of places. Whatever it is that we're dealing with here is extremely dangerous. The figure looks like a person who's been living inside a cardboard box behind a bowling alley, but from the way that it sounds, Either it's been puffing down a pack a day for the last 30 years, or it's not a person at all. It also took the kid in the blink of an eye and without much of a fight, so there's reason to suspect that it's inhumanly strong and might hold some kind of mind control power over children. Overall, it's already safe to say that Christmas this year isn't looking too bright for the kids in town, unless someone can stop this thing before it strikes again. Now would be a great time to remind their kids that they need to run away screaming at the top of their lungs if some grim reaper looking freak starts trying to stuff them in a potato sack. Whatever this thing is, it seems like it needs to lure the kids away from their parents before taking them into its dark realm. So the adults should make sure to always keep their little ones within arm's reach and be ready to throw down with this ghoul on a moment's notice until the disappearances are solved. The next day, this girl Amy's mom comes to pick her up early from school and she looks stressed, but the girl's disappointed to hear that her father won't be joining them. He's too busy with work, explains her mom, but we'll soon find out that what he's really working on is a new relationship with a younger woman. Over the river and through the woods to grandfather's house they go, but as soon as they get there, Amy rushes straight into her room without so much as a hug for Pop Pop. The old man and Vanessa start talking about what's been going on with her husband, but he's disappointed that she hasn't told Amy the truth yet. Meanwhile, Amy decides to call her father and ask him to join them for Christmas. He's hesitant at first, but after a bit of convincing, he finally agrees that he'll be there for dinner the following night. Just then, a mysterious woman arrives at the door unannounced, and Grandpa is not happy to see her. She insists on coming in, but instead of introducing her to the family, he abruptly hustles her through the house and straight to his bedroom. It looks like Grandpa here might have what the kids call these days a sneaky link, but the truth is that she's not here for his winter sausage. This woman, Leslie, breaks out a bunch of reports about young kids who've been going missing all over town. She's convinced that the witch has returned and came to warn him that they could all be in danger. Grandpa doesn't want to hear it, but the woman insists that it's true, finally convincing him to meet her and the other survivors at the town church tomorrow night. While alone in her bedroom, Amy notices a sinister looking woman in a black cloak waving to her from outside. Just then, an unnatural wind blows the bedroom door shut, but when Amy turns back around, the woman has disappeared. At school, Amy's friend Colum and this bully kid are left alone in detention when they hear a sharp crash coming from a camping tent in the corner of the room. Thinking that it must be an intruder, the bully here does the only logical thing and proceeds to immediately crawl directly towards it. Colum tries to warn him, but it's already too late. In an instant, the witch yanks the boy into the tent, and when Colum and the teacher go to check it out, there's no trace of him left. 
Okay, is it just me, or do none of these kids in this town have any sense of self-preservation? Any kid whose brain cells haven't been completely depleted by watching too much skibbity toilet should have seen the red flags here from a mile away. Clearly, the witch must have some level of mind control over them but a trap only works if you fall for it. So you can't let the intrusive thoughts win if you want to survive. Now, I don't know what's going on with there being a whole camping tent inside of a classroom, but that's besides the point. With this being after school detention, these kids should have known that nobody else was supposed to be in the building except for them, their teacher, and maybe a few employees from the front office. The teacher left the room, so if there's something flailing around the inside of the tent, then it's safe to assume that you have a problem. These kids should have obviously kept their distance, or immediately gone on the offensive and thrown a full speed drop kick right into the side of that tent. The moment that they sensed any danger, they needed to start tossing their chairs across the room like this was a WWE match, and then ran to get a trustworthy adult as soon as humanly possible. Column here was lucky enough to escape with his life, and that's only because he had his classmate to use as a meat shield. But this gives us another hint as to how this creature operates. So far, it seems like it's only going after bad kids. This kid right here was a bully, while the first kid took candy from a stranger and was interrupting his mom at church. So as long as you're good, then you should be fine, right? Maybe, but the witch is also stalking Amy, so it looks like even the well-behaved kids need to be careful. It also waited until the adult was gone again before it chose to strike. So for now, being near adults seems like a good way to stay safe. Speaking of Amy, she needs to tell her mom and grandpa about this creepy lady who's been hanging out in the backyard right away instead of trying to be friends with her. The same goes for Colum here. He should be very clear with the adults about what he's just seen so that they can act responsibly to get ahead of the next attack. And as for Vanessa, her father is acting awfully suspicious, and I'd be sure to keep a close eye on him until she figures out what's really going on here. The next day, Vanessa and Amy give Grandpa a ride over to the church so that he can meet up with the rest of his witch survivor support group. Column's teacher is there, along with several relatives of the missing children, and everyone seems to be on the same page about the witch having returned. It turns out that a woman named Molly supposedly took the lives of several of the town's children back in the 90s. Grandpa and the other adults decided to take justice into their own hands taking her out to the woods and killing her for what she'd done. Leslie starts passing around some blurry photos of a woman standing out in the woods as proof, and everyone is immediately convinced, except for this guy Joe, who thinks that it's all a bunch of baloney. She explains that as they put her to death, the woman Molly placed a curse on the bloodlines of everyone who was involved, vowing that an ancient witch known as Frau Perchta would one day come for them and their children. Just then, Joe has to step out to take a phone call from his babysitter, but it won't be long before he finds out what they're saying is 100% true. Okay, this is some important information. Now that we have a name for this creature, we can start to figure out more about its origins, behaviors, and most importantly, how to kill it. Frau Perchta is a winter goddess from ancient European folklore whose main goal is to punish families who haven't been properly sticking to their Christmas traditions. If you've been working over the holidays or letting your house get too dirty, then she is not going to be very happy when she finds out. She's said to appear in one of two ways either as a beautiful woman dressed in white and surrounded by snow, or as a disheveled old hag with a wrinkled face, hook nose, and tattered black cloak, which sounds a lot like our prime suspect here. Some legends say that she also might have one awkwardly large foot, which supposedly indicates that she can shapeshift into an animal form. Over the holidays, Frau Perchta roams the countryside in search of houses where young children live. If the kids have been behaving themselves all year, then they might find a silver coin hidden in one of their shoes the next day. Sounds pretty harmless, right? Not if she finds out that you've been causing trouble. You see, that's when things take a much darker turn. If you find yourself on the naughty list, then watch out, because Frau Perchta here is gonna sneak into your room late at night, slice open your belly, take out your insides, and fill the hole with straw and rocks. She'll also do this if you've eaten anything other than her traditional meal of fish and gruel on the night of her feast. Even one gingerbread cookie is enough to get you butchered. Personally, I'd say that this sounds a bit extreme, but to each their own, I guess. Because she was so powerful, Frau 
Kochta actually had a cult following whose members would leave out an offering of food and drink in the hope of receiving her blessings. Kind of like Santa Claus with his milk and cookies, except uh, with more murder. On certain days during the year, people from the Tyrol region of Central Europe host a festival in her honor, where two groups meet in the center of town to battle it out using wooden sticks. So now that we know what we're up against, how can we turn the tables on old Perchta here before more kids end up missing? They could try leaving out an offering of her traditional meal to win her over. If they'd rather go on the offensive, beating her down with a wooden stick might do the trick. They also suspect that the woman Molly was the one who put the curse on them, so making peace with her spirit might get her to call the witch off. If they're truly sorry for what they've done, then the adults of town could go back to her gravesite, apologize to Molly's spirit, and give her a proper burial, especially when that problem is the vengeful spirit of a cannibalistic witch. Back at Joe's house, the babysitter is getting ready to put his daughter Tilly to bed, but the girl is a total brat and refuses to go to sleep without being told a bedtime story. She doesn't want to hear about Winnie the Pooh or Snow White either. She wants something edgy, and the babysitter has just the tale. She's going to tell her of Frau Perchta. According to her, the witch's spirit resides in the darkest depths of hell and will come for you if you say her name three times while facing a mirror. That's Candyman, replies the girl, insulted. The babysitter challenges Tilly to try it if she's so brave. Lighting a candle, the two girls go into the bathroom and repeat Frau Perchta's name three times while looking at their reflections. Just then, the candle's flame mysteriously goes out. The babysitter goes to turn the lights back on, but when she does, the witch suddenly appears standing right behind Tilly. The two of them flee out into the hallway, only to see a very spooky pair of hands appear from around the corner, and they run for their lives into a bedroom closet, but neither of them is gonna make it out of this alive. The babysitter tries to call for help, but for some reason, she can't seem to get any cell service. That's when they hear the landline ringing from downstairs, and she bravely convinces this actual child to go for the phone while she hides out in the closet. Turns out to be a bad choice, though, because moments later, Frau Perchta emerges from out of the darkness right behind her, and just like that, her babysitting days are officially over. Tilly immediately leaves her for dead, while the witch ties her babysitter up with a string of Christmas lights. Terrified, she hides out in another closet and arms herself with a wire hanger, but it's no use. The witch quickly discovers her hiding spot and takes the girl away, but she isn't finished yet. Returning to the babysitter, she cuts a hole in the woman's stomach and fills it with Christmas lights. By the time that Joe finally makes it home, his daughter is nowhere to be found, and the babysitter is hung up from the balcony like some kind of demented lawn decoration. Okay, if this babysitter wasn't already dead, then she'd need to be fired immediately. Let's not forget that she was the one who dared Tilly here to go summon the witch in the first place, and then had the audacity to try using her, a literal child who she was supposed to be taking care of, as a meat shield. Before this, the witch still hadn't killed any adults yet, but it's not surprising that she decided to start with her. Now, her babysitting skills were bad enough, but their survival skills were truly some of the worst that I've ever seen. Hiding in a closet should always be an absolute last resort. Instead, they should have immediately sprinted out of the house and either tried to get help from a neighbor or jumped in a car and made a break for the town church. Tilly here must have learned from the worst because while she could hear her babysitter being slowly murdered in the other room for what it felt like a good five minutes, she made the unbelievably idiotic decision to hide in a different closet instead of running for her life while she had the chance. At least she tried to fight back unlike the babysitter, who didn't even take a swing. With the first adult victim finally meeting her end, the witch is now going after adults first instead of the kids. So any children who don't want to end up dead should stick near adults as much as possible. That way, they'll always have a good supply of meat shields on deck. There's no telling if saying her name three times in the mirror really summoned her, or if these two just happened to be up next, but if anyone else has heard of this theory, then they might be able to use it to their advantage. It's a long shot for sure, but it could be possible to use multiple mirrors to just keep constantly summoning the witch between different locations before she has a chance to attack. It's not the most foolproof idea, but you never know until you try. 
Also, if the adults are paying attention, then they should notice that the way that the babysitter was put to death matches up with the witch's symbol, and with some doodles that Amy has been drawing. It seems like they share some kind of psychic connection, and it could be possible to use this to predict where the witch might show up next or who her next targets will be. At the church, Grandpa and the remaining survivors are busy discussing what they should do next. They've noticed that the witch seems to be unable to step inside of the church. The priest also points out that she's most likely hiding somewhere in the forest, since that's where they killed her all those years ago. There's only one night left until Christmas, which means that she'll have to come for all of them soon if she's determined to get her revenge before the holiday. Meanwhile, Amy is sitting alone in the parking lot when she spots this monstrosity creepily watching her. Instead of immediately freaking out, she starts making friendly conversation, as if she's going to invite the witch over for some crumpets and a spot of tea. The creature produces more grandma candy from her pockets, and Amy here is genuinely about to take the bait. But luckily, her mother shows up just in time. After everyone else has left the church, Grandpa and his woman get another chance to talk alone. It turns out that Leslie here is much more than just a side piece. She's his ex-wife, but Vanessa has no idea and refuses to let her back into their lives. She's terrified that none of them are going to make it to Christmas morning, but he tells her to meet back at the church the next day so that they can come up with a plan to fight back. When they return to the house, the family notices the number 12 written in blood on their front door but it isn't long before Vanessa here shows up to kill the vibe, demanding to know what's really going on, finally coming clean. He takes a seat on the bed and begins to explain. Many years ago, a total of five children disappeared from the town in the days leading up to Christmas, with one of them being her older sister that Vanessa here never even knew existed. Convinced that a local outcast named Molly Fletcher had taken them as a blood sacrifice to the devil, the other townsfolk decided to partake in the timeless Christmas tradition of vigilante justice. After forming an angry mob, they took the woman off to the woods and strung her up from a tree. Over Overall, it was a pretty chill time, except for the part when Molly put a witch curse on everyone's bloodlines, and one lady sliced her stomach open with a machete. While they're busy reminiscing about the good old days, Amy heads out by herself to start cleaning up the blood. Sure enough, Frau Perchta appears from the shadows. Amy here decides that she looks friendly enough and immediately lets her guard down. But just when the witch is about to take her in, Colum shows up on his bicycle and the woman disappears. He tries to warn Amy about the obvious stranger danger, but she isn't so sure. She argues that since the woman hasn't killed her yet, it must mean that she's actually nice, which is some foolproof logic if I've ever heard it. Colum hands Amy a bouquet of flowers and gives her a peck on the cheek before his aunt comes to take him home. But the two of them will never see each other again. Okay, I thought that the real kidnappers were supposed to bribe you with a puppy, but maybe they only had enough left in the budget to hire a cat? Anyway, these kids really don't know anything about being safe around strangers, do they? Little Amy here almost walked right up to that lady in the parking lot, and then did the same thing again when this horrific looking abomination showed up outside of her house. What she needed to do here was immediately run back into the house screaming bloody murder and tell her mom and grandpa exactly what she saw. That way, they could take the appropriate action, put the house on lockdown, call the police, and get ready to fight like their lives depend on it, or take her somewhere else where they could be safe, like the town church or a friggin' gun store. She may have managed to escape with her life for now, but unfortunately for her friend, he isn't going to be so lucky. So Colum and his aunt are walking home down a dirt path through the woods like Ichabod and Crane, when all of a sudden they hear demonic noises coming from somewhere in the darkness. Instead of immediately running for their lives, these two geniuses decide to investigate. There in the woods, they find a strange ritual site with the fire still burning, and a bunch of gingerbread men that are covered in what must either be blood or strawberry jelly. Suddenly, the witch grabs his aunt from behind and starts cutting more gingerbread men out of the skin on her back. Instead of running away or trying to fight back, Colum here runs straight towards the witch, and she stuffs him into a burlap sack without much trouble. After taking a quick break to sample one of her cookies, she carries Colum off into the forest, quickly disappearing from sight. Okay, seriously? This one seems like it should be obvious, but do not, and I repeat, do not, 
ever. Under any circumstances, go to investigate some strange noises and Blair Witch ritual sites that you find out in the woods late at night. If you hear or see something like that, especially when kids from town have been disappearing all week, you need to run as fast as you can and as far away as possible. So they fell for the trap. That's bad enough already. But Callum, my man, pick up a stick for Pete's sake. Don't just sit there and let Mother Krampus do your auntie like that. You were supposed to be the smart one, Callum, but now your poor aunt is dead and you're off to Krampus land for the rest of eternity. Do better next time. After Amy goes off to bed, Vanessa here decides to have a look through some of her father's things. Unfortunately, the drawer is locked, but luckily the key is in the drawer literally right above it. Inside, she finds some half-empty bottles of booze and a cookie tin where the old man keeps most of his important documents. To her surprise, there's an old police badge inside the tin, as well as a picture of her as a child with the older sister that she's forgotten all about. When Vanessa wakes up the next morning, Grandpa is already putting up wooden crosses all over the house. He asks her for a ride back over to the church, but before they can leave, they're caught off guard by an unsuspected visitor. To her shock, Vanessa sees that her cheating husband, Wilden, has just arrived outside. Not only that, but he's brought his literal girlfriend over for Christmas dinner at his wife's father's house. Somehow, Wilden here did not predict that this would be a problem, and he's frustrated with her for not being open to the idea. Things are pretty awkward to say the least, but Vanessa and Grandpa still have to head off to church, leaving her husband and his girlfriend alone with Amy for now. Amy doesn't really want to hang out with her dad's girlfriend either, deciding to go off to her room instead. And this absolute psycho is actually surprised and insulted that everyone is giving her the cold shoulder. Worst Christmas ever, she thinks, but she has no idea that it's also going to be her last. Vanessa and her father arrive at the church, but Leslie is nowhere to be found. While he's going over the evidence, Vanessa finally puts the pieces together and realizes that Leslie is actually her mom. It's gonna have to wait though, because that's when Grandpa figures out that, according to the pattern of disappearances, Amy is going to be next. Okay, this is not good. With everyone else dead, the witch is officially coming after Amy. They need to get ready for a fight now. But the good news is, old man Winter here is already ahead of the game. The wooden crosses that he's been setting up over the doors and windows are an example of a type of protective magic. It may seem old school, but some ancient cultures would actually surround their house with homemade crosses just like these to protect themselves from witchcraft. Besides crosses, there were many other symbols and artifacts that were believed to achieve the same effect. Gargoyles and other scary faces were originally put on sides of buildings to frighten away witches. Objects called witch balls, glass ornaments similar to the ones that we hang on a Christmas tree, were used to distract the evil spirits with their bright colors and then trap them inside. Alternatively, witch bottles were small glass containers filled with hair from the cursed person, needles, and red wine that were carefully hidden somewhere within the house. You see, the hair attracts the witch, the needles get her stuck, the wine drowns her, and then you throw the bottle into an open flame to finish the job. An anti-witch mark was a pattern of overlapping circles that could be carved into a home's walls or doorway, and which would confuse the witch as she got stuck trying to follow the line. Many magical practices also call for the use of a magic circle, which can be any one of several different patterns that you draw on the ground with salt and will protect you from harmful spirits as long as you remain inside. It seems like Gramps here has been studying up on counter-witch strategies. So he needs to start hanging ornaments in the windows, putting his hair into bottles, carving witch marks into the walls, putting little Amy in her own magic circle, and using any other techniques that he can to try and ward off Frau Perchta. Of course, if all else fails, then at least they always have the husband and his girlfriend to use as meat shields in a pinch. Unable to get Amy to come out of her room, Wilden and his girlfriend decide to whip up some Christmas dinner instead. When the other two return, Grandpa is busy keeping watch through the windows, while Vanessa sits down for some awkward small talk with the girl who stole her man. The conversation almost immediately turns hostile until Vanessa calls her a quote, waste of oxygen wannabe. 
straight to her face, and the girl storms outside to go wait by the car. The girl stands around pouting in the driveway, never suspecting that Frau Perchta is quietly closing in. Suddenly, the freak pins her up against the car and stabs her in the neck with a candy cane before she can even react. Wilden happens to come walking out of the house at that exact moment, finding her badly injured but somehow still alive. He quickly carries her back inside, while the witch returns to leave her mark on the door in the girl's blood. While the adults are distracted, Frau Perchta starts calling out to Amy, who quietly follows the voice outside, despite the fact that there is a woman literally bleeding to death from a candy cane wound that the witch just gave her. She makes it all the way to the front door, where she finds the little naked cat sitting there on the porch. Luckily, Grandpa here catches on to what's about to go down and manages to save her just seconds before Frau Perchta would have taken the girl away. Preparing for a fight, Grandpa rushes Vanessa and Amy over to his panic room and hands them the most formidable weapons that anyone could ask for. Some tubes of wrapping paper bundled in Christmas lights, saying that they should keep the witch back. Suddenly, the witch appears directly behind them, and Grandpa takes an overhead chop at her with his axe, but she catches the weapon and throws him across the room with ease, knocking him unconscious. Instead of fighting back, Vanessa and Amy decide to cower in the corner. It looks like all hope is lost. That's when Wilden shows up out of the blue and socks Frau Perchta straight in the jaw but it only seems to make the witch more angry. Effortlessly, she lifts Wilden here straight into the air with one hand, while burning the side of his face with the palm of the other. It looks like he's totally screwed, but the scuffle at least buys Amy a chance to escape. Okay, now we've seen that the witch can at least be physically injured, but they're going to need something that's a bit stronger than Wilden's Fists of Fury to finish the job. And it seems like the only way to get a hit in is with a sneak attack, so here's what I'm thinking. Since the witch's main goal is to take Amy, the adults could use her as a distraction and then crack the witch in the back of her head with an axe while she's focused on the kid. It's risky, but it just might pay off if they play their cards just right. With Wilden out of the way, Emperor Palpatine here turns her attention on Vanessa instead and begins to use the Force to choke the woman within an inch of her life. At the last moment, Grandpa jumps the witch from behind, but she hits him with the old razzle-dazzle, turning the weapon on him instead. The adults are powerless to fight back, leaving the witch free to go after Amy, and that's when she does the most terrifying thing of all. After walking into the bedroom where Amy is hiding, she takes Grandpa's axe and starts going full George Washington on any random piece of furniture. As a matter of fact, she's having such a good time that she completely forgets that she's supposed to be looking for Amy, and the girl manages to sneak out of the room undetected. Meanwhile, the girlfriend gets up and starts walking around aimlessly until the witch finds her in the living room. Terrified, she moves at the speed of a snail towards the kitchen, where she finds a pot of water and throws it at the witch's face. Unfortunately for her, this isn't the Wizard of Oz, and the witch tosses her into the kitchen island, snapping her spine from the force of the throw, but she's not done with her yet. The witch proceeds to tie the woman up on the table and starts slicing into her back with this rinky-dink little electric carving knife. Taking pieces of her skin, she places them into a cooking tray and stuffs them into the oven before setting off to find the remaining survivors. Okay, uh, let me get this straight. There's been a woman slowly dying from a candy cane wound to the neck laying on their living room floor, and a crazy witch lady prowling around outside, but nobody in the house has called the police yet? Kind of seems like something that they should have done already. I don't know, maybe the witch cut their phone line with her magic. Now, the girlfriend here got attacked because she was a bad person, and that fits the witch's M.O but it doesn't explain why she's still coming after Amy, since the girl's been nothing but good. It must be because of what her grandpa did all those years back, and that's why he needs to do the right thing by offering to sacrifice himself so that the witch will let the little girl go. Think of it as a, it's a me that you want sort of deal. 
There's no guarantee that this will work, but this whole thing is really his fault. So it's time for Gramps to step up to the plate and take responsibility like a man before his whole family ends up paying the price. Out on the back porch, Grandpa is slowly dying of his wounds, where he sees Frau Perchta crawling towards him, but his fate is left unknown for now. Meanwhile, Vanessa is back on her feet, but doesn't make it three steps before she's yanked into a dark room. Luckily for her, it's only Wilden, but he's looking more like Harvey Dent these days. They have a quick heart-to-heart, -heart, all is forgiven, and she gives Two-Face here a big smooch before he heroically sets off to find their daughter. Out in the living room, he finds that his girlfriend has been brutally killed. He ends up getting distracted by what's cooking in the oven, only for Frau Perchta to jump him from behind and starts choking him out with a string of Christmas lights. Here comes the airplane, she says, as she starts trying to feed him pieces of his dead girlfriend. And he fake vomits in a way that's somehow more disgusting than if he'd actually thrown up for real. Once she's had her fun, the witch chokes him unconscious, but this isn't the last that we'll see of him. The witch finds Amy hiding behind the Christmas tree and is about to take her when Vanessa steps in and chucks a present at her back. Annoyed, she pulls back the curtains on the window, revealing that she has Grandpa tied up in a chair. Vanessa and Amy take shelter in an upstairs bedroom, quickly slamming the door shut behind them. Meanwhile, Two-Face here actually regains consciousness and begins searching through the house with an axe, with the witch standing directly behind him. Eventually, he makes it to the bedroom where the two of them are hiding, but they think that it's the witch trying to get through the door. Instead of saying, hey, it's me, he readies his axe and prepares to chop that down, all while Vanessa is cowering just on the other side. Suddenly, the witch grabs Amy through the bedroom window, Vanessa screams, Two-Face swings, and we cut to black. Okay, and it looks like that's the end of that. Great job, parents of the year. Ruining Christmas would have been bad enough on its own, but this is disappointing on a whole other level. Vanessa and Wilden, you f***ed up! First of all, you're both terrible fighters. Wilden, this was supposed to be your moment, but you let your guard down almost immediately. And to make matters even worse, got taken out by string lights. String lights, man. Seriously, could you really not break your way out of those with your daughter's life on the line? I've heard of people being able to lift cars off of the ground to save their kid, but I guess you just don't have that dog in you after all. And Vanessa? A present? Really? That was the best weapon that you could find to save your daughter's life? Come on, lady! What was that? A box with a t-shirt in it? And if I were Amy, I'd be downright embarrassed if I wasn't too busy worrying about not getting kidnapped by a demonic witch. The two of you should have worked together to protect your kid, not given the witch a chance to pick you off one at a time. Coming together to prove that you could fix your relationship might have even gotten you all off the naughty list and redeemed you in the eyes of Frau Perchta by turning this into a feel-good, lovey-dovey Christmas story like the kind that you see on the Hallmark Channel, but I guess that we'll never know now. At the beginning, Vanessa here said that she didn't want poor Amy to grow up with only one parent like she did, but now both of her parents are about to die, and Amy is off to Krampus land. On the bright side, at least she'll be with the rest of her friends. Merry Christmas, Vanessa and Wilden. You guys f all the way up. Blood seeps out from under the door, and Wilden realizes what he's just done. Heartbroken, he turns straight into the witch, who rips his beating heart right out of his chest with telekinesis. In the bedroom, Vanessa is actually still alive, but it's not looking good. As Amy crouches over her mother, reassuring her that she's going to be alright, the woman dies in a horrific fashion, gurgling up blood and convulsing on the floor until she finally succumbs to her injuries. With her parents dead, the witch enters the room, cornering Amy in. Placing her hands on her face, she begins giving the girl visions of the past. And that's when she finds out what really happened all those years ago. You see, it turns out that Leslie was the killer all along. Grandpa killed their own daughter to help cover up her crimes. And the two of them placed the blame on Molly, who was really completely innocent. Leslie shows up late to the party, but just when she and Grandpa are about to bounce out of there, he sees Amy come running out onto the porch. She tells him to stay back, saying that she knows the truth about what they did, playing it off. 
Grandpa steps in to grab her, but that's when Amy stabs him in the gut with a kitchen knife. Furious, Leslie steps up to confront the witch. It looks like there's about to be an epic showdown, but nope. The witch slices her throat with an axe, and Leslie falls down dead too. Reaching out her hand, the witch leads Amy off to her ritual site in the forest, where she appears to literally sacrifice the girl to the devil, just as the old legend foretold. And Amy here has finally learned the hard way what I've been trying to tell her all along, which is never take candy from strangers. But what would you guys do? Let's say you've been good all year, and yet Krampus still shows the f up and starts terrorizing your whole life. It's Christmas. I don't want to have to be worrying about this sh and are my parents really to blame for all of this? Let me know down in the comments what you would do. Thanks for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos just like this. Shout out to the team for making this possible and uh, have a damn good Christmas.